Good afternoon. On behalf of the Inter-American Development Bank, we welcome you to the event COVID-19 and the Future of Our Planet, a conversation between IDB President Luis Alberto Moreno and Lord Nicholas Stern, Professor of Economics and Government and Chair of the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment at the London School of Economics. The topic of the conversation is climate change policy and sustainable recovery from the pandemic. The event will be in English with interpretation into Spanish. Para oír el evento en español, haga clic en el icono del mundo que encontrará en la parte baja de su pantalla y seleccione el idioma. Please send your questions to Paul C at iadb.org. President Moreno, please go ahead. Good morning, everybody, and it's a real honor and pleasure to have with us Sir Nicholas Stern. Uh, clearly, few people around the world know as much as he does on issues of climate change. He, he certainly has been a great partner and, and a sponsor and supporter of much of the work that we have been doing for now over 15 years at the, at the IDB. And as we think about all the different uh, challenges surrounding COVID, clearly we are now in, in, in this very difficult period of restarting our economies, but we need to start looking ahead. And we start, need to start looking at, at how not only do we get back growth, but how do we meet the sustainable development goals amongst which climate is a fundamental one. And it's been knocking on our door for some time now. COVID happened uh, very quickly, but climate change has been uh, happening in slow motion, but in a very severe way. So today we're privileged to have with us uh, uh, Sir Nicholas Stern. Uh, he's a professor of economics and government at the London School of Economics and chairs a number of initiatives. And he recently, in fact, published a paper, among others, uh, with uh, uh, Professor Joseph Stiglitz uh, on the findings on long-term climate-friendly stimulus policies uh, that you know, could help in the overall economic growth. Uh, but without further to do, uh, thank you so much for being with us, uh, uh, Nick. And, uh, and uh, why don't you give us some opening remarks and then we can start the uh, having some questions from the audience and some uh, that, of course, uh, I will make uh, to kick off the conversation. Over to you, uh, Nick. Thank you very much, uh, Luis Alberto, and uh, thank you for um, being such a leader through the IADB and in other ways on um, climate, environmental, uh, SDG issues across the board. And I still remember, um, I think it was your first annual meeting in Belo Horizonte, uh, something like 15 years ago. And what you've done since then has been quite remarkable. So thank you, thank you very much for that. Um, and I know we continue working together for more decades. So thank you for that. Now, in, in starting, let me open with perhaps four broad points. The first is the magnitude of this crisis. Uh, just in the UK, it's these kinds of statements are true across the world, but just in the UK, the Bank of England has said it has not seen a fall of output of this kind for 300 years. I think going back to the South Sea bubble. And this is much bigger than what we saw uh, in the global financial crisis of a dozen or so years ago. Because that one was in the financial systems of rich countries, mostly. It had knock-on effects, of course, but it was occurring mostly in the financial sectors of the rich countries through their own mismanagement. But this one is everywhere. The health crisis is everywhere and the economic crisis is everywhere. So this is deeper than before and it's truly global in a way that the uh, crisis of a dozen years ago was not. And we have to recognize that there is a grave risk of a global depression. And we have to act as policymakers, investors, development banks. We have to act in a way that recognizes that danger and acts strongly and in the right way 
to build a better future, to build back better. But if we do not act strongly, that Great Depression could be deeply damaging. If you think of what a mess we made in Europe after the First World War, we did not handle the uh, demobilization of the troops. We created mass unemployment. Of course, we dealt with the Spanish flu at the same time. That came as well. We tried in many ways to turn the top clock back to before the war and the punitive sanctions on Germany in large measure, as Keynes recognized very clearly, led to um, essentially the fascism which followed um, in the dark period between the wars. We were, it was a very nationalistic response after the First World War. So we've seen that after these kinds of traumas, we can do very badly by looking inwards, trying to restore some kind of status quo ante um, by following bad or doctrinaire economics. So we've seen how to do it badly and the consequences are terrible. I think we did better after the Second World War. We were truly internationalist. We established the United Nations. We established the uh, Declaration of Human Rights. We established the Bretton Woods Act. Bretton Woods institutions, the beginnings of the European project came uh, from that time. We established the World Health Organization and we established a system where uh, you had strong growth and poverty reduction uh, in many parts of the world. So we've seen that consequences after trauma can be either good or they can be bad and it's up to us it's what we do. And the history of pandemics is, is similar, actually. You can come out of it well, you can come out of it badly, but it's up to us whether we follow those routes. So the magnitude of the crisis, I think, has not yet sufficiently been realized in economic terms. I hope it's beginning to be realized in health terms. It's a terrible pandemic. But the economic risks that we face, I think, have not been properly analyzed. There's been, I think, overconfidence about bouncing back. And uh, we have to drive back through strong uh, action. So that's the first and first point I wanted to make. The second is that we should recognize, commit ourselves to no going back. That was a very dangerous world that we lived in. Um, fragile from the point of view of the economic crises, of course, the financial crisis was uh, an example. We've seen that it was fragile in terms of some methods of production and supply. But it was also fragile in terms of inclusion and social inequalities, and that builds up stresses which can uh, disrupt systems, uh, as well as being morally unacceptable, the extreme inequality is also dangerous from the point of view of social fabric. But it was also very fragile from the point of view of the pandemics themselves. Pandemics come, around, come about in large measure from um, interactions between wild animals, domestic animals, and human animals. And we've been changing those radically through climate change, through biodiversity loss. And you now to take just one example, um, birds are now meeting in the Bering Straits from different parts of the world, which did not meet before. And that is a, uh, a recipe for future viruses. Uh, the wild animals and, and domestic animals come into contact through climate change and biodiversity loss in, in different ways, and similarly with ourselves as humans. So pandemics come in large measure from zoonotic diseases, and zoonotic diseases come from the radical changes in those interactions. So for all those reasons, the uh, place we've come from, I hope we recognize as a dangerous place and that, that there are real alternatives much more attractive. So my second point is we must agree no going back. Let's build something better. Let's build back better. Let's understand the dangers of where we were and how we were operating. The third point I want to make is 
that we must be very careful not to rush back into austerity. There's lots of talk about fiscal space. There's lots of talk about debt to GDP ratios. And that is understandable because uh, there has been a lot of public spending and a lot of loss of tax revenue. Um, many of us have worked in finance ministries, indeed, some of us, you know, Louis have been finance ministers and so on. So um, we recognize that. But how do we come out of this? We have to be clear that we must do our best to come out of this through growth and that we will have to bring down debt to GDP ratios. But we must be careful not to set ourselves targets that try to do that too quickly. And that will be, I think, a very important principle. Because if we say we're going to bring down our debt to GDP ratios over 15 years, that's very different from bringing them down over five. And if we try to bring them down over five, what will happen? We will undermine the growth that we need to get out of this problem of, of uh, unemployment. And indeed, of course, with debt to GDP ratios, if you suppress GDP, you push up the debt to GDP ratio. So we will have to be careful with the public finances, but we must be very careful not to try to do things too fast because we will prevent the growth that, uh, that we need. It's also a moment where if we're thinking of investment, to have investment to financial, to have financial institutions like the IADB, like the European Investment Bank, they are going to be extremely important in a world where there's a loss of confidence and a loss of liquidity. So I think this is a moment when uh, those institutions can play a very important role in financing the growth that we need. So take the time to restore the public finances, use the investment finance vehicles that we have through multilateral development banks. And I confess in my own country, I'm trying to get a national investment bank established in the, uh, in the UK. Uh, for the same reasons, we need investment vehicle, investment finance vehicles that can uh, really push in a counter cyclical way, as well as take the long term uh, view, both. So that's the third point I wanted to make. So I've made sort of points about what we shouldn't do. We should not try to go back. We should not try to bring down that GDP ratios too quickly. Um, what um, should we do? What's the positive story? There, it, it seems to me that we have been talking for a long time about the attractions in terms of jobs and the way uh, we live uh, in the drive to the low carbon economy. You know, we get cities where we can move and breathe and be productive if we do this well. We get ecosystems which are robust and fruitful if we do this well, and it's full of job opportunities, innovation, discovery, investment, and growth. And we've been arguing that case correctly, in my view, for some time. Now, that case still holds, but in front of it, we have a recovery which we must manage. And if we think of the kinds of investments that are going to pull us out of that recovery, we should be looking for investments and employment, of course, associated with those investments, which can move quickly. And so we want speed, we want labor intensive, we want multipliers. Well, as it happens, so many of the sustainable investments are exactly that. They can be done quickly, they're labor intensive, and they've got strong multipliers. Think about retrofitting buildings. Think about making uh, cities more attractive to pedestrians and to uh, cyclists. Think about rooftop solar. Those are all physical capital stories. Think about natural capital. Think about the forests. Think about restoring degraded land, water management. All of these can be fast, labor intensive, with strong multipliers. That's a Keynesian dream, fast, labor intensive, strong multipliers. And it comes from the sustainable route. So the sustainable route to recovery is not only good recovery from mass unemployment, which we have, it is also something which lays the foundations for 
the uh, low carbon sustainable uh, story of growth and development, which we've uh, managed to understand and start on over these uh, last years. So I think that is a very important set of opportunities. It's not only that we shouldn't go back, it's that if we go forward in a sustainable recovery, it can be a faster recovery, a more attractive recovery, and lead us to a much better form of growth. It involves investment in natural capital and physical capital. We're going to have to invest in human capital with all that unemployment. It's going, this surely is a time to uh, be training for the job opportunities of, of the future. And of course, if we do that right, then we will try and try to rebuild uh, some of the social capital and the social cohesion which is so important to stable, healthy, attractive, democratic uh, societies. So there's a real opportunity here. There's a very positive story about moving sustainably out of this. But it will need strong action, clear ideas, and real leadership. Thank you for those comments, uh, Nick. And you, you point to something that is central, and is this notion of the mismatch in uh, in terms of uh, tenors for, for lending and the fact that most countries in the world, uh, they, they are concentrating, of course, in uh, curbing uh, the so-called bell curve uh, of contagion, but that of debt and unemployment and poverty is really on the rise. And the space that governments are gonna have to need uh, and construct precisely to meet, among other things, with the sustainable development goals. Uh, is going to be critical. Otherwise, we are going to be uh, seeing a set of setbacks that is uh, very, very central. So let me let me start with a question, and, and I invite, of course, the audience that is following us to, to do theirs. But in fact, there is a, a recent survey by Ipsos that suggests that 71% of those people who were surveyed believe that climate change is a serious crisis, uh, just as COVID is, and 65% of people support a green economic recovery. How can we help countries build that awareness? Because, I mean, you've been at this for, like you said, when, we, for, when I was first starting at, at the IDB 15 years ago and you were making this case, how can we get the awareness and the traction uh, to really get uh, some fundamental policy changes to make a serious advance on, on the whole question of climate? Let, let me answer in two parts. You know, the part of life that was led up to December 2019, and then the part of life which is the first month of 2020. Going up to 2019, uh, December 2019, I think we had started to make real progress in the preceding year or two. We had uh, commitments from many countries to go to net zero. In my own country, we committed to net zero emissions by 2050 as a result of public discussion of the, of the science, where we needed to go, and a realization that the route there was quite attractive. We had more and more big firms, including in the energy sector, BP and Shell and, and so on, saying they were going to go net zero. We had Microsoft saying, we're not only gonna go uh, net zero, in a flow sense, we're going to look back and see how much emissions we were responsible for before. You had Alliance declaring at the UN uh, conference in September last year that they were going to take their portfolio, big uh, financial institution, they were going to take their portfolio to net zero by 2050 with clear um, uh, milestones along uh, the way. And for me as a university teacher, particularly important was to see young people. And young people were challenging us in a way. They were pushing us hard uh, with all the energy of young people, which is very healthy. But they were on the right side and they are on the right side of history. They understand. And it was very good actually to see school children, university students really mobilized around something of such fundamental importance. So I was beginning to feel that we'd made a lot of progress uh, up to the end of 2019. Uh, you know, a couple of years before, the net zero was hardly in the vocabulary. Okay? Um, 
it, it's only three years or so, you've seen the youth mobilizing in quite the way that they did uh, before. So up to the end of last year, I, I do think there was quite strong progress. Now we have to ask ourselves the question, um, what uh, has happened in the last few months that could disturb it or take it forward? Well, the things that could take it forward is that we've actually experienced clean air. I've, I've had wonderful photos from my friends in Delhi telling, showing the, the blue skies, uh, photographs of birds that are coming back, saying that the asthma in their children has become less. And that's my friends in Delhi. I mean, the stories you can tell from around the world. I think some of us have been very happy not to be on aeroplanes. And uh, we realize that the stress of travel, uh, and often it is stressful, um, some of that is unnecessary. We've been quite resource efficient. Many of us have been using things in our pantries and larders that we didn't realize they were there. We're throwing away less. And that's a positive thing. I think we've realized, and this is very important, that we can change very quickly. And people think, oh, change is difficult. There's always lots of inertia. And we've discovered actually that we can change very quickly. And I think that's a positive thing as well. And perhaps most important of all, I hope we recognize our common humanity. We are all vulnerable to this. And I hope we've recognized how much we value company and community. Because for all the Zoom calls, and it's lovely to see the faces of friends, it's not the same as giving them a big hug and having a meal together. So those are the things, clean air, less travel, resource efficiency, rapidity of change, notion of community. Those are positive stories. And if we reflect on that, then it seems to me that we can see that we have the resources as human beings to make the change and that it's a very attractive sort of change uh, to look for. Against that, people say, look, I, it's been so disruptive, I, let, just let me get back to where I was before. Uh, one thing at a time, let's just do employment. And that, for the reasons I've already described, I won't repeat them, that's a mistake because we were not in a good place. And the jobs of the 20th century are not the jobs of the 21st century necessarily. And if you go back, you actually build back insecurity. Stranded assets will be stranded jobs. So I think we have to share our experiences, reflect, discuss how things have uh, changed, reaffirm many of the lessons that we had been getting to about change uh, last year. Um, but this is a public discussion. This is um, something for communicators and journalists and politicians and academics like myself and everybody. And I hope that our young people continue to drive us forward as they were driving us forward before. Thank you for that, Nick. You recently published a, a, a paper with Joe Stiglitz that basically sets a set of messages uh, for both uh, national and city governments on how they should plan their green recovery uh, responses. Could you talk a little bit about some of the things that you outlined there? Yes, um, I've alluded, I've already remarked on the, um, some of the basic principles that we want to be looking for if we want to get a big recovery with a strong emphasis on employment. We should be looking at things that are fast, labor intensive, and with strong multipliers. And the strong multipliers often come from low import content of uh, act, act, activities. And so we actually asked um, policymakers, central bank officials, finance ministry officials, uh, prompting them really to share with us the kinds of um, ways of getting back that they would find uh, made sense in these uh, circumstances. And we found that there was quite a lot of match in their own thoughts between economic multiplier 
and uh, sustainability or, or climate uh, potential. So they told us, and we were trying not to prompt them, but uh, we, they told us about the importance of clean physical infrastructure, building efficiency, retrofits, investments in education and training, natural capital, and so on. So they actually told us about the right kind of physical capital, the human capital, and the natural capital. So we were quite encouraged, actually, that those thoughts were beginning already in finance ministries. And we've had such a difficult time. I mean, I've been in the finance ministry, you very much so, Louis Alveda. It's a hard time to be there. And they're working uh, all the hours of the day and night on the rescue phase, which is now. Yet it was quite encouraging to see that whilst they hadn't worked all the plans through for the recovery, they had not. They were thinking in a way which we felt was, uh, was very, uh, very productive. And um, also I should add that in some poorer countries, there was also an emphasis on uh, rural income support, rural infrastructure, employment guarantee schemes and so on. And that also I thought was interesting, uh, interesting as well. So I think the potential amongst the economic decision makers for a move in a good direction is there. And that's why it's so important not to be derailed by confused and backward looking notions that let's just reestablish what was there before. I have a number of questions coming here from the audience. One of them, it says, should we be rethinking our concept of economic growth post pandemic or should we embrace slower economic growth? I, there's a distinction between growth forever and the next 10, 20 years. And in the next 20 years, for me, the big challenge is to change the way we do things, to grow in a different way. And I think when we find that if we grow in a different way, we will find that two things. One is that the growth is not necessarily slower. It could be faster because it's innovation, discovery, resource efficiency, new ways of doing things. We know already that renewable energy is cheaper than the old form of uh, energy. So the crucial thing for me in the next 10 or 20 years is to change the way we do things and invest and innovate. And that will actually give us growth and uh, employment. Um, if we stop growth now, without changing the way we do things, our emissions are way, way too high. As a world, we're over 50 billion tons of CO2 equivalent a year. If we stop growth right now and didn't do anything else, that would stay there and we'd be in deep trouble uh, from the point of view of climate. So for me, the priority in this next 10 or 20 years is radical change. We do not have to have such a destructive relationship between economic activity and the environment. We can change it and we can change it quickly. And for me, that's the big priority. And I, so I don't see it over this next 10 or 20 years as a trade-off between growth and environmental responsibility. Actually the opposite, I think the pursuit of the zero carbon economy will give us strong growth, but it'll give us much more than that. It will give us, as I said earlier, cities where you can move and breathe, and ecosystems which are robust and fruitful. So it will give us longer lives, it will give us stronger communities, it will give us more equitable communities. More people are hit by pollution and climate change particularly uh, badly. A lot of the jobs that we're talking about could be uh, at the lower end of the, uh, of, the, of the wage payment spectrum. So I think I would not present it as a choice between growth and environmental climate responsibility. I would present it first as a radical change in the way we do things to stop the destructive relationship between economic activity and the environment. And as we do that, we'll find for the next 10 or 20 years, actually we will grow, arguably stronger at least, I think, I think so. But also we'll get so much of the other things of health, inequality and so on, uh, that we should be valuing. There's another question coming from the audience. There was a lot of public discussion in, at the outset of this crisis uh, around the, the, the fact that there was man's abuse of the natural world that 
got us into this. And that link seems to have faded from the public consciousness. What kind of changes can we realistically expect in the way we treat biodiversity and natural resources? And as you know well, of course, Latin America is and the Caribbean are home to 40% of the world's biodiversity. Yeah. Well, I hope that uh, if people reflect, as they sh we all are reflecting, should be reflecting now, on where we've come from and how this pandemic uh, happened and how bird flu and swine flu happened earlier, that they will come to the conclusion that simply from the point of view of pandemics, we were in a dangerous place. I hope they come to the conclusion that um, from the point of view of air pollution, we were in a dangerous place and the people whose lungs are damaged by air pollution have, become, have been those people also more vulnerable to this uh, virus. So I think that if we, uh, if we have that discussion about how all this happened, so if we have a discussion in the context of the health consequences of our past ways of living. Um, I would hope then that from that discussion, which is about health, which is about the moment that we're in, that people could draw the conclusion that we need to be somewhere different and in particular uh, recognize the dangers of destroying biodiversity and the value of the biodiversity itself. But that's a discussion that we have to have explicitly what we don't want to do is say, people say, look, I'm too busy to have that discussion. We're just trying to build back to where we were. Well, if you do that, or we do that, that is building back to a continued destruction, which will make this kind of problem we're in now just more likely. And the only way to do it, I think, is public, public discussion of, uh, of, of these uh, issues. It involves pressure from young people involves pressure from people who are reflecting on these experiences, but it also involves leadership. Here's another question is, how could governments harness the support from the financial regulators in supporting the Build Back Better process? Are there examples of practical suggestions uh, of successful cooperation between policies and financial regulation and supervision? Yeah, I think, let me, do this in, in two parts. One is the um, way in which we come out of the crisis with all the lending, and then more particular about financial regulation. But right across the world, um, governments will have a lot of outstanding loans to the private sector as it's tried to keep the private sector and private employment afloat. And it was right, that was the right thing to do. It is the right thing to do. And the first priority in the rescue period is, um, is employment. It's keeping people in, uh, in jobs. But that leaves the debts. That leaves the debts to the private firms. Um, and I was not in favor of strong conditionalities in the rescue phase. First job on the economic front was to save the jobs because destroying jobs is destructive to everything and um, including health, of course. So um, that was the first stage where I didn't think that conditionality was crucial or shouldn't be too aggressive. But now it seems to me that we have to think positively as to how these loans are dealt with. Are they rolled over? If so, under what conditions? Do some of them get translated into equity? If it's translated into equity, then the government, one way or the other, has a big role to play in the decisions in the firms that uh, it owns. So at that point, which is in many places really now, from the coming months, the government has to decide what to do with the stakes that it has. And there it seems to me to push for the jobs of the future, to push for investments with the future, it makes every sense. It makes sense from the point of view of security of employment, and it makes sense from the kind of society, from the point of view of the kind of society that we're trying to build. So um, I actually even don't like the word conditionality in this context, 
it's, I think, partnership for secure jobs, partnerships for uh, secure and sustainable investments. Uh, and that will be an industrial strategy because the government is there. It, it is there because of the, the loans that are outstanding. So I think I would see it as not heavy conditionality, but a shareholder, a partner, helping find a way to future jobs, to secure jobs for the future and not the jobs uh, of backward looking uh, activities. The second part is, I think, a question about financial regulation itself. And there I think um, the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosure was a very strong initiative by Mark Carney, Mike, Bloom, Mike Bloomberg, and it's really starting to pick up. And it's asking financial institutions to be transparent about where their money is going. And um, if I'm a pensioner, is my pension company putting my money into uh, jobs of the future or jobs of the past? And if it's putting it into investments and jobs of the past, it, it's taking risks on my behalf I don't want to take. It's actually doing things on my behalf I don't want to do. So I think the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosure is actually a good push for business because it reveals risks that probably had not been properly understood. The risks of um, backing high carbon when the world is moving in the other way. And it also, of course, can conflict with the wishes of people whose money that is, as their financial institutions. So I think that kind of regulation on transparency is good for stability and it's good for investment in the future. And more and more companies are recognizing that. And I think more and more companies are seeing that the people who've done best in terms of stock market valuations uh, in these uh, last months have on the whole been those with a focus on sustainability. And they have done quite well. Um, just another underlining that these are the investments of the future. So some regulation to push in that direction when I think the consequences of uh, investing in the old economy are not yet sufficiently understood or realized or taken on board. I think that kind of regulation is important. I hope they'll that will be part of the story of how we emerge. There's another uh, question here, speaking about low oil prices, and isn't that an opportunity to begin to remove a lot of the subsidies that governments have had for many years? But what tax and subsidy policies could help countries move towards a net zero by say 2050? And uh, of course, everything around uh, ridership and, and revenues uh, related to mass transit and how you know mass transit can become something much bigger as we go forward. Well, I, I fully agree with the premises of the person who put that uh, question. Now is the time to get rid of fossil fuel subsidies. Now is the time to um, put on carbon prices and carbon taxes. Uh, there will be pressures on the public finances. I warned against trying to push too hard on fiscal austerity uh, in the early stages of the recovery, of taking it slowly. But we do, we will need extra revenue over the coming years. And it's much better to raise revenue in a way that's very efficient, in other words, by discouraging something damaging. Uh, much better to raise revenue that way than another way. But um, I would, not push this just as revenue raising or primarily as revenue raising. I'd, I'd want to press the argument in terms of leading to a much a more resource efficient economy, a much less polluting economy, a much more attractive economy, the economy of the future. So it would be perfectly understandable if that tax revenue was used directly to support the poorest people in society, if that tax revenue was used uh, directly to um, help with clean infrastructure, R&D and so on. 
So uh, the most important argument there is about the kind of incentives that it brings and uh, getting away from the bad incentives of the old system. So get rid of fossil fuel subsidies and bring in carbon pricing now, I think is a very important part of the process. And as you do it, again, as the question has suggested, invest strongly in uh, public transport. Uh, obviously, in the very short run, people are wary of public transport over this next year. But we all trust that at some point in the next year or two, that will uh, go, go away. And uh, so uh, the traction to public transport will come back. And remember, public transport has enormous advantages in terms of social inclusion, in terms of uh, air pollution, in terms of resource uh, efficiency, and of course, climate. So I do think that the mass transit story is important whilst recognizing that for the next year or two, there'll be some caution and we have to organize that well. And in that period, I would push very strongly for um, cycling and uh, pedestrian. And I have to say, uh, my sons and uh, daughter who are around 40 uh, years old, they're all thinking of uh, electric scooters. So uh, I think that creativity electric bikes, electric scooters, ordinary physically propelled bikes, walking. I think this is a moment where we can push very hard uh, and there'll be a, a strong willingness uh, to do things that uh, perhaps would have been more difficult before. And remember what I said earlier, we found out that you can change quickly. And that's a positive lesson from this. Yeah, no question. Uh, this is a very interesting question around tourism. Uh, you know, there's many islands of the Caribbean, especially that, you know, a good chunk of their GDP and their growth depends on tourism. How can they become more sustainable and make sustainability a factor by which uh, you can be more attractive as a tourism destination? I think um, the, of course, there are lots of, uh, there are lots of examples in, in your part of the world of ecotourism, which has been developed uh, very strongly so that the tourist uh, expenditure when they come is helping invest in the kind of change that's necessary from the point of view of biodiversity and, and the climate. So ecotourism is a big part of the story. I also think that um, we must push very strongly for rapid change in air travel and uh, I do think that there is a future out there with um, low carbon fuels. And this should be a moment when we push very strongly for low carbon fuels. Because you know, to go from Europe to the Caribbean, most people don't have the time uh, to go uh, by boat. So I think a very strong push in the direction of low carbon fuels is very important. And that is a moment, I think, when the airlines are obviously in, in trouble, they're having to cut back, they're looking for support. I think to accelerate the route that we were going before is, uh, is very important. So that's something where it seems to me that the world's researchers, the engineers, the scientists, the technologists, should go flat out for zero carbon uh, fuels. And I, I do think that that's uh, possible. It's a question of putting resources to make that happen very uh, quickly. But as someone who is um, devoted to uh, cricket uh, and has been to the Caribbean to watch cricket, I do think that uh, uh, addressing directly the uh, challenge of um, taking uh, air travel much lower carbon is, is very important. But also, we should not leave the discussion of that part of the world without talking about resilience, because we know that uh, we're over one degree centigrade now, we're on the edge of the period of 
Holocene period since the last ice age, 10,000 years ago. That's the period where we grew up, we, we cultivated, we had settlements and so on. And uh, we know that, that, that the Caribbean and, and, and Mexico and so on, that Central America, and of course much more broadly, are very vulnerable to uh, climate change. So resilience is a fundamental uh, importance there uh, as well. Another question, over the past 20 years, many companies base their decisions on manufacturing entirely on cost. Is this a time to rethink value chains and prioritize regional and local production? I think we've, there's a very interesting set of arguments here around globalization and internationalism. And I think we need more internationalism, particularly now to build back better across the world when we're so dependent on global public goods such as biodiversity and, uh, and climate. So we need much more internationalism. We don't necessarily need more globalization. And globalization um, in some ways had started to retreat in terms of the location of economic activity. But I think it's very important to distinguish those two words, internationalism and globalization. I suspect there will be a bit less globalization because with um, advance of technology and 3D printing and so on, you can do so much more that in many ways, uh, robots are displacing all kinds of activities, including labor intensive uh, activities. So the cost argument for going abroad for low cost labor is less. So if you think of value chains, if you think of um, the nature of work and robotics, um, then it seems to me that we should expect that uh, some increased localization of activity will take place. And that's fine as far as, uh, as we economists ought to be concerned because it is more robust and in some ways it's cheaper, but it's, you have to look at the whole system to think about uh, the cost. It's not a narrow, immediate view of cost. So I think we will see less globalization, but I would be very worried if that meant less internationalism. Another question here, uh, Nick, is uh, how do we ensure investment in nature without having the proper mechanisms to value nature properly? And how do we collectively create those mechanisms? There, uh, it, I mean, it's a very important uh, fundamental question. And I think um, part of it has to come from um, regulation and the institutions necessary for effective regulation and the legal structures. So protecting the Amazon uh, does require the stopping of certain forms well, it requires the stopping of, of deforestation and we've got the ability to do that now in terms of observation from satellite. We can understand what's going on, but we need the political commitment, and legislation and the uh, administration to do that. That's, as it were, the control side of the story. And we do need that. Um, but we also need the positive side of the story. And let me give you an example because um, I give it from my own experience is that I'm on the board of a, a charity in India called Sanctuary, which is a wildlife uh, charity. And what they've been finding, and this can be done all over the world, is that if the people who live near a national park uh, are enabled to get together and turn their own land over to wilding uh, in exchange for um, some of the revenue from tourism, that they're very willing to do that and it works very well. And uh, in, in India and in Latin America and many subtropical and tropical places, if you do that, it grows back very fast. Nature can be quite uh, resilient. So you can actually create uh, real incomes out of uh, ecotourism and uh, natural 
tourism. So that's a very positive way of doing things. It requires community organization, but we've seen it can be done. And then I would add to that um, the uh, agricultural extension and revisiting the way in which agriculture is supported. Because so much, and this is particularly true of Latin America, as you know much better than I do, uh, so much of agriculture there is very land intensive. And uh, often land is wasted or mined and uh, depleted. And then you move on and do some more. But looking after land in a much better way should enable much greater productivity of land and also um, less encroachment and less incentives to encroach. So those are two very different ways. One is the wilding story, for example, around national parks, which can really create incomes for local people, often very poor people. And another one is uh, revisiting the way in which agriculture uh, occurs. And I think there have been, there's been some very interesting studies recently that if you take the world subsidies for agriculture between half a trillion and a, a trillion dollars a year, mostly those subsidies go to uh, soil mining and soil destruction. They go to using chemical inputs which poison our uh, waters and uh, our land. Often they go to uh, you know, a very homogeneous and uh, unattractive and unnutritional form of production. So they're wasteful and they're poisonous and they undermine uh, nutrition. If you just took that money, same money, so you're not taking any money away from agriculture, just spent it in different ways, you'd find that uh, the destruction of the environment and the quality of food and the standard of living all could uh, rise. So part of it is regulation and enforcement. Part of it is uh, new forms of um, wildlife and, uh, and uh, eco-tourism. And part of it is just doing agriculture much, much better than we have been doing before as a result of misplaced uh, policies. So I think there's a tremendous amount that we can do to make this happen. And of course, there's always the pricing, which we you know we should be pricing natural capital much better than we have done uh, before. And I do think that the emphasis on net zero means there'll be a lot of people searching for negatives. And of course, that's exactly what regrading of land and, uh, and creating more forests rather than destroying forests can do. So those are four ways in which, I mean, there's so much that uh, we can do and we really have to commit ourselves very strongly. I know we're running out of time, but I, I want to make a last question. We spent, you know, a good part of this hour talking about climate change and the many implications. How do we think about growth going forward? Uh, but as we think of the opportunities that come with, with the COVID-19, uh, certainly there's big systems to be changed. Uh, certainly, uh, sanity, the whole question of health systems, uh, but especially one that you're close to, which is education. How do you see education changing in fundamental ways? I mean, you see it certainly at the university level. You're a professor in, a, in one of the great schools in the world with the London School of Economics, where everybody is learning uh, uh, through uh, digital means. But how do you see going forward the kinds of changes that we can introduce to education that fundamentally can prepare not thousands, but millions of people to get the quality of skills that they need for this post-COVID world? I think it's a tremendous opportunity, and I, I agree with you very much, uh, Luis Alberto. You know, I've, I mentioned right at the beginning that we discovered how fast we can change. Um, well, I, I think you know Manoush Shapik, who's our very distinguished uh, director at the London School of Economics. And she said that within two weeks, we did an introduction of online teaching that she had thought might take a five or ten years. And we've seen what's possible. 
And I think that we will be able to take education much more widely than before. I hope we'll change the emphasis of our education to be still more strongly on the natural world, natural capital, community, common humanity, uh, human rights, and, and so on. Speaking about social sciences, which is what LSE is all about. I hope we'll be teaching our scientists to tackle the really big problems that matter. Look how they've got behind finding a vaccine. Look how they got behind tackling HIV uh, AIDS. So I do hope that it changes the priorities in science and technology. It's not just a social science story. I think the humanities uh, will be, as they always have been, educating us about what really matters, about fundamental values, about the human condition. So I do think that this is a moment when we need to take our education forward in a way that makes it much more widespread and takes it out there. But I also hope that um, the human contact, which is such an important part of student life, is not lost. So we, as we take advantage of these enormous digital opportunities, we must also think about how students relate to teachers, how students relate to each other, and how students relate to the community in which they live. So as we take these huge opportunities of making education so much more widely available, I hope we'll think about the substance of education along the lines that I described and the human interaction side of it, because you know, we, um, we made our friends at university. You know? I met my wife at university more than 50 years ago. And the, these interactions, the teachers I was with, you know, I was with Bob Solo and Ken Arrow and Jim Murley's magic names in economics for the economists uh, uh, amongst you. And you know those people. And it's not the same just seeing them on the screen. So we have to, this is a moment of radical reform because of what we've been through and what we now can do. But we must use it very carefully. Well, thank you very much, Nick. It's been a fascinating conversation. Thank you for uh, always being so inspiring and thoughtful and, and all our gratitude for having had the chance and the privilege to hear you for this uh, past hour. So thank you again and stay uh, healthy and, and strong as always. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. And thank you so much for inviting me. And it's been a pleasure to work with you all these years and I'm sure it will continue. And thank you to everyone on this for coming. Thank you, thank you. Bye.